Good evening, everyone. Wow, what a special night it is. And I am thrilled to be here and to share this exciting ceremony with our inductees. I started my Massachusetts golf career at Indian Ridge Country Club in Andover, Mass. I was blessed with wonderful role models in the game. Flo McCluskey, Nancy Black, Chippy O'Connor, and Joanne Goodwin. My golfing journey began at the age of 11 in New Hampshire. And another role model that is here tonight, and I would be remiss if I did not mention her name, is Jane Blaylock. Jane is the CEO of our Legends Tour, which is the senior division of the LPGA Tour. JB, thank you for your help. Thank you for keeping our dream still going at this stage of our lives. I'm always asked, what does the Hall of Fame mean to me? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I believe it is the ultimate achievement in my sport. It's the crown jewel. To have my state, Golf Association, recognize my record and my career, that is the most rewarding and most filling honor in the game. I thank my family, my mom, who is here tonight, a young 90 years old. I thank... I thank my five brothers, Chris, who is here tonight with me. I thank the Hall of Fame committee, and I thank all of you out here tonight. I spent 30 years on the LPGA tour, and I knew, I felt your cheering, and I felt your support all along the way. Finally, I would like to say congratulations to the class of 2014 and just welcome to the hall. Thank you. I, I caddied for Ann Pitch, that's Margaret Curtis, about 50 years ago. About 100 years ago, her caddy was uh, Frank Wiemann. Um, that screen had some nice photos, uh, and, and near the end there was a uh, elegant, uh, 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 mature woman uh, uh, ready to tee off, being watched by a little girl. But what you need to know is the little girl was Aunt Pitch. She was uh, at 13, could beat the best in the business, uh, but she didn't win the national till you heard till she was in her 20s. Um, I caddied with her um, uh, at the Essex County Club, and it was about 1960, and uh, she must have been in her late 70s, but I was impressed that she, um, one of the uh, drives ended up within four feet of the cup. It was one of the short holes. I don't know which one. If anyone here is from Essex County Club, they can tell me which hole it was. No answer. Okay. Four. Four. The four? <laughs> you started high and ended low. Anyway, it was, uh, she still knew what she was doing, but uh, uh, apparently was, uh, and she kept up the golf right, uh, right to the end. Harriet uh, tailed off. She was, all the sisters, there were five sisters, were quite interested in social work. They set up a uh, health clinic in East Boston. They not only helped raise funds for it annually, but, but uh, manned the desks occasionally to fill in. And as you heard, Margaret worked with the Red Cross in Paris during World War I. Um, uh, and uh, Harriet uh, became Dean of Women at Hampton Institute, which is an all-black college, so it was uh, unusual, but she stuck it out for four years as a fill-in, and she greatly both worked hard for education and minorities. Um, that's about all I need to say. You know the rest. They, I'm, I'm, I'm on, they, they would have been honored to uh, have this recognition for their work and their golf. Thank you. Applause is 
It's not for me, but thank you. It's for Ted. Uh, I am given up an unusual honor tonight uh, to represent, in his behalf, uh, a citation that's magnificent. And in a few moments that I have, it'd be hard for me to, to give you the magnificence of this man. Ted was, as a golfer, a very tall man. He was around six five or six feet six. That, if you ever played the game, you know, is tough on your balance. And boy, did he have good balance. He was born with a very calm disposition. He could absolutely suppress the magnitude of the moments that were facing him. I was a lucky caddy in 1946 to be at Woodland when Ted came back after four or five years in the service and he had his cocky cap and uniform on and went out to play golf. And that was my first meeting with Ted. We got to play an awful lot during the 50s and 60s. And I have to tell you about three things that he did that in his day, no one could think of. He shot two rounds of golf in the greater Boston area where he made 11 birdies and seven pars in the round. One of them was at the Charles River Country Club. The other was at Woodland. No one did that. It was just impossible. The other thing that comes to mind is Dave, uh, when Dave Sullivan, who was a New England and Amateur champion, was at Charles River Country Club with us, Harry McCracken, you all know Harry, we were sitting around on a Saturday when the finals of the state amateur were being played at the Fitchburg Country Club. And it was a 36 hole event, so we had played golf in the morning. Ted was up in Fitchburg playing against Dave Sullivan, who were both friends. So we said, let's drive up. We're gonna see the, the afternoon match. When we got to Oak Hill around 12.30, we were amazed to found that, find out that our friend Dave Sullivan shot a 71 and was seven down. <laughs> now, if you know Oak Hill at all, the back nine, first four, four holes of kidding. Ted Bishop could do things like this. And, and that's magnificent. No one did these things then. And I'm so honored to have known him. And I know if any of you folks have played golf around this area in the last 50 years and you won, a club championship or a ladies guest day or a member guest and you brought home a trophy or a bowl, if you look underneath that, there's a little seal that said Tepco Company. And that was Ted Bishop Company. And he supplied a great many nice trophies for all of the people who played at that time. I just can't say enough about him. He was just magnificent. He walked the fairways like gracefully. And he, he was just so graceful. He was just so wonderful. I felt honored to be in the right place at the right time and to have had the privilege of playing and knowing him. And thank you very much. So Joanne and I are going to have a little fireside chat here. I called Joanne earlier today. This is kind of different from her getting up and and there are two reasons why she's not get up, getting up and giving a speech. One is she may not trust herself, and the, and the other reason is she may not trust me because she wrote out my question. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate that. The first question that you wanted to talk about is how you got started. Your dad was a golf pro, Plymouth Country Club, in the World War II in the 50s, and so he probably just said, here, Joanne, start playing, or did he? Well, uh my father was offered the pro job at Plymouth Country Club during World War II, and he discussed it with my mother, and they decided that they would try it. All the time that my father was a pro at Plymouth Country Club and later at Haverhill Country Club, my mother worked in the pro shop with him, so it was a team event. And at Plymouth, we rented a cottage across the street from the club, and when my brother and I came home, we would change our clothes, we came home from school, and we would go to the club because our parents were there and we spent many hours there. At that time, Plymouth Country Club 
The clubhouse was very small. It was a snack bar and uh, the pro shop. So we helped them with selling the snacks and selling some of the golf equipment. And on weekends, there was a, a cooler that we had out on the 10th tee. And at that time, we didn't have refrigeration. We had an ice box in our house. And so on the weekends, my father would go to the ice company and get a block of ice and put it into the cooler so that we could keep the soda Cool. So we sold snacks on the weekends and the soda. I helped my father when he gave the lessons. There wasn't really a driving range. So I would watch him give the lessons, and then afterwards I would go out to get the balls. And it gave me an opportunity to see what a good pro does, to analyze. Usually I would analyze the swing as he was analyzing it, and just see if I found the error. Usually. It was not. Usually he had something else to tell them. So we were there so often that uh, my father taught us the game. And at that time I was 14 before I played in my first tournament, the state junior junior championship. And today we have youngsters 11 and 12 who are qualifying for and playing in national championships. So it was just natural for us to play the game. Started more as family time and a chance to work and then all of a sudden you had a club in your hand watching your dad. That, that's great. So the game obviously has changed a lot. In fact, when you started playing, there were, and you wrote the question, there were no pull cards? There was nothing. I mean, it was it was very different. Your dad wasn't wild when he saw those pull cards either, was he? Uh, before, um, about the middle of the 40s, before the pull cards came in, so if you played, you either had a caddy or you carried your own bag. In the fall <coughs> and the spring, when the kids were in school, then you, in Plymouth, you had to carry your own bag. But one day, a salesman came in and he said, Mr. Goodwin, I have something new. It's called a pull cart. You put your clubs on the cart and you pull them on behind you. So he said, do you think any of your members would like to uh, try one of these carts? And we have a Donald Ross design course at Plymouth Country Club. The first three holes happened to be open. So some, a group was going out and they said, oh sure, we'd like to try this. So we stood at that time, the clubhouse was on a knoll and my father and I, some of the members were watching this group play. And my father said, what is this game coming to? You, you, you can't carry a bag, you've got to pull it along behind you. And then the, pool, the uh, riding cots came in in the 60s, but before that, I went to Pennsylvania to play in the Eastern Championship, and they had a very hilly course. So in some of the holes, after you hit your drive, you could walk over to the side, to the rough, and they had a rope toe, and you could press the button, hold, hold on to the rope, and it would help you walk up the hill. But I tried it once or twice, but by the time it took all the time and energy to get over there, to get back to the fairway, uh, it really wasn't worth it. So it was great when the riding cots came in. <laughs> one, one of the tournaments you played in when you were 16 was the state girls junior championship and there was there you were I think in the finals and your score was Margaret Curtis. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, didn't, I never knew Harriet. She wasn't around when I was young. But we knew Margaret. She would be there at the opening lunch, sometimes the closing lunch. And when I was 16 at Framingham, I was playing in the junior finals and she was our scorer. The one thing I remember most about Margaret is that she liked to look for golf balls. So as we were walking along, she would be looking along the fairway or looking along the brook. And when I retired from teaching, I went through my scrapbooks. A lot of the scrapbooks had been in the cellar. There had been floods in the basement. And I was surprised that I had that card that she had signed. It was a beautiful card, beautiful penmanship. She did the tally for it, and, and I, I, through the last few years, I knew that I wanted to send it to the WGAM so that they could have it for their memorabilia. So I told Becky, I said, you know, I have that card, 
and I want to be sure that I leave it with you. So even though she did a perfect job keeping the score, she still had time to look around for a golf ball. <laughs> so we know the, golf, the game of golf has changed a lot uh, since you played, um, and especially professional golf. These professional golfers now, they have entourages and, and all kinds of people around them. Quite a bit different than it was back in your days. You weren't quite as spoiled as they are today. That's right. Well, uh, today, uh, if you want to play in the women's national amateur and probably the men's also, they have sectional qualifying. So you have to qualify in your section, and then you go to the tournament site and you qualify there also to get into the match play. In 1959, a friend of mine from Massachusetts decided that we would go to Washington, D.C. And at that time, all you had to have was a five or under handicap. And you sent in your entry, and you were in the tournament. So when we arrived, we went into the locker room, and the pairings were already made. 128 people were playing. And my friend and I were playing each other in the first round. So we went a thousand miles to play against each other. <laughs> and it was very hot in uh, Washington. Some of the people decided, uh, why don't you take the umbrella while you're out there, wet a towel, put it through the spokes. But, but I tried it. But the umbrella was heavy. It was heavier with the wet towel. So we gave that up. But the people that I stayed with, uh, the woman, I knew her, friends of ours, and she said, we're trying something new. Uh, we always roll up the rugs in the summertime. It makes us feel cooler. But we're trying something called an air conditioner. <laughs> and if you'd like to try it, it's in my son's room, but we can move him out, and my friend and I can stay there. So at least we were cool in the evening, but it was very hot there in the summertime. So you played in an LPGA tournament nearly 60 years ago. So tell us how many women were involved, what the money was, what, what that was like. Uh, I played in Lake Worth, Florida in one of the tournaments. There were only 33 women pros then, about 1955. And they would ask the amateurs to fill in so that they would have more people on the golf course. Of the 33 players, only 25 uh, got money. And it's amusing that they did not round off to the nearest dollar. They um, would give the winner uh, $1,247.59. And, <laughs> and, and the last place, $95. <laughs> and, but it was amazing that some who were great did not get any money. Kathy Whitworth, who went on to win 88 tournaments on the ladies tour, she did not place in the money that time. And Betty Jameson, who liked to wear a string of pearls when she played, she was out of the money also. For some people, those were very lean years. And they made it easier for those who came later. Well, Joanne, thanks very much for laying the foundation for golfers today.
Um, dad passed away about three years ago, and uh, given that this is Massachusetts, given uh, a lot of teaching professionals, professionals in golf, and a lot of his friends, I'm sure he's with us tonight. So I'd just like to say hi. My mom, uh, she, uh, she's had a bit of hard luck. She had surgery about uh, a week ago on her back, and she really regrets not being with uh, her friends as well. I was in uh, the country Myanmar, which is uh, formerly known as Burma, uh, about two or three weeks ago before I came over here. My family and I, we live in Thailand, and I was sitting down having dinner with actually uh, about 15 guys, a bunch of strangers, but they were kind enough to invite me to dinner. And uh, they were about 55 years, it was the youngest, and 85 years was the oldest. And uh, we got to talk, and the guy said, Tim, you know, you've lived in Thailand for 15 years. What do you enjoy doing? And I said, well, I play golf in my head every day. And he said, well, small world. He said, I'm the secretary general of the Burmese Golf Federation. <laughs> so we had a lot to comment, you know, a lot to talk about, because uh, golf brings good people together, doesn't it? And so I said, by the way, my dad, uh, my dad was here about 50 years ago. And he just looked at me and I swear, I swear I was looking at a guy that was having a heart attack standing up. I, I, I didn't understand the expression on his face and all of a sudden these tears started streaming down. And he said, your dad was uh, Paul Harding. I said, yeah. He said he was a great man. He didn't say anything about how far he hit the golf ball, how you know, six tournaments, the PGA, the five mass opens. He said he was a great man. And uh, Massachusetts, the MGA, the Hall of Fame Committee, Tatnick Country Club, Green Hill, you guys made him. Yeah, I mean, that's what that guy was talking about. You guys made him. If he was here today, he, he would thank absolutely everybody. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be talking about his accomplishments. He'd be thanking everybody here. My mom, the, uh, the Harney family, every member of the Harney family thanks him very, very much. And uh, he's honored. We're honored. And uh, thanks, thanks for cultivating that, that legacy. So I appreciate it. This is probably not the greatest fit to uh, a brief end of the night. I am basically consumed by golf 24-7, and you're basically sitting next to a treasure chest right here. Um, this is this 10-minute photo session this afternoon lasted an hour and a half. So we are going to do our best. We can do it, right? Sure. <laughs> um, you know, you're a guy, you, you remember Masters, you played in Masters, you played in the U.S. Opens. You won the tournament in Havana. I don't know how you get over there, you just swim? No, we flew over. <laughs> but there's one tournament I know that remains special to you. Let's talk about 1958, the State Open. I always wanted to win the State Open, and I didn't think I'd ever win it because it was later in my career when I was fortunate enough to win at Hyannisport. And uh, I'd like to share this with you because I had birdie the last hole won the tournament. And if, if, if you all know the green at Hyannisport, it was sloping from back to front and I was on the right hand corner of the green. And I had to, Bob Crowley was standing on the back of the green. And I had to put the ball and almost hit his foot. The ball broke that much. And I could see Bob standing in the back of the green, and I had to aim and see how close I could come to his feet. And this ball had a big break. And the ball rolled up, and Bob looking at it, the ball rolls past his foot, breaks down, hits the back of the hole, bounces about six inches in the air. 
<laughs> and I looked up to see where Bob was, he disappeared. He left the ball in the hole. And when I met him in the locker room later, he said, uh, that ball hadn't hit in the hole, you ran out the green. I said, isn't it funny how that ball got in the way? The hole got in the way. <laughs> and uh, when he stayed open, I hadn't realized what I had done. Uh, and then when I looked at and found out the champion that won that tournament, Paul Harney, one of my one of the great friends, Pat and Paul, great people. Uh, Paul Harney was a super guy. What, what, what a wonderful family. Uh, and uh, well, the names that you joined. Uh, Hayes. Byron Nelson won the tournament. Hayes. Hayes. Sarah. Hayes. Hayes. And I had met all these guys. I met Hayden, Saracen, and, and then when I looked to see that all these champions had won this tournament, I didn't realize what an elite group of talented people that won the Massachusetts State Open and to be a part of that winning legacy. That was one of the greatest thrills in my life was to win the State Open because I had never won a State Open. And I won one and I won. I won that after I actually got on tour. It was always easier for me to come back and try to compete and win. And uh, one of my one of the most wonderful, ch uh, cherished achievements was to win the State Open and uh, be a part of uh, the great players that won that tournament. You know, I asked Bob, you know, he's taught thousands of people to play the game. Ted Williams, mm -hmm. Eddie R. Carroll, mm -hmm. I mean, he taught them all. And I, you know, he's met everybody. He's won in the 1954 tournament. He won, I think, at the time, was the richest tournament world, championship. world championship of golf. That was the first fifty thousand dollar first prize. First. <laughs> and uh, I signed a contract for another fifty thousand to do exhibition tour. All of them. I did fifty seven exhibitions all over the, uh, all over the United States and Canada. And, uh, all of a sudden, I got rich. <laughs> I think I made uh, over a hundred, some odd thousand dollars back in 1954. And I became a leading money winner, and my wife became a leading money spender. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, she was, she was good at that. But I'll tell you one thing, she did it with class. <laughs> Though, when I asked Bob, I said, listen, you, I know that nights like this, you want to thank people, you want to talk about people you've met along the way, and he's met everybody. And I said, well, who do you want to talk to? And he goes, two Massachusetts golfers. You mentioned them briefly, Paul Honey, and I know Pat Rabbit. Well, I used to, I knew Pat when she was in college down there, in Miami. And, and, uh, I remember working with Pat. I always enjoyed her, her the tremendous talent she had and how competitive she was. And I asked her tonight, I said, uh, who had the greatest competitive skill to play golf? You or, or uh, what's, what's, what's a, a tour player? Keegan. Were you a better competitor than Keegan, Pat? <laughs> I knew I'd get that. We rehearsed that. And uh, I just love to watch her play golf. You talk about a dynamic woman that wanted to learn how to compete and play and win. Uh, I admire the way she played the game of golf. And, uh, she's always been a great friend. And I love you. You've had a great, great career, great life. Made a lot of friends, a lot of fame, a lot of fortune. But there was one time when you basically were broke. And you were out on the West Coast. And I, I asked him the turning point in his career, and he said it's simple. What was that time 1949? In 1949, uh, I was in California. And this, I started a tour in 48, and I only played two winter tours. I couldn't afford to play the summer tour. Didn't have enough money. So I'd come back and work in Northampton. 
trying to make enough money to go back on the phone if you can. Uh, I was uh, in Carmel by the sea. And of course, I had a checkbook. And I didn't have enough money in my checkbook to pay for my lodging. I didn't want to call my family, tell them I was broke. I called a guy named Joe Stack in Dead of Mass. Anybody ever heard the name Joe Stack? He was in very influential with a lot of the people in Boston. And I called Joe and I said, Joe, I'm broke. Send me some money. He sent me a thousand dollars. And if I hadn't got that thousand dollars, I might have to have to go back home all the way from California. I finished the winter tour. I started playing good after I got that cash. And if he hadn't sent me that money, you probably wouldn't be looking at me today. <laughs> Joe Stack, by the Devon, Massachusetts. He's a great guy. I think I speak for Bob and I, I, for all of us. I think all of us are only as good as the people behind behind us. You know, you were married for 57 years. 57 years. Uh, I married a girl, a Scottish girl named Lynn Stewart. And I was married to her for 57 years. She was beautiful. Uh, she was a model. She was auburn hair. She passed away about three years ago. And uh, she made me what I am today. Behind every, behind every great man, it's a great woman. Mm. I gotta introduce my family, right? Well, I was gonna introduce them, but I would say that you know I came in tonight thinking I knew most of Bob's life story and stuff. Till I realized he's not even the youngest golf professional in his family. And he's 88. His brother's 89. Yeah, but he tells everybody he's younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> but is, that's the way of you. You introduce this great family that's been behind you all these years. Right. If you don't mind, a break protocol here. I want to do so. All these people who came up here to, to enjoy these festivities with me. So, I'll start with the, uh, my first and born son, Robert, would you please stand? Don't clap, don't clap to everybody I'm missing. <laughs> Robert, would you please stand, okay? Okay. Uh, Tom, Tommy Toski, my brother. Adrienne Toski, my granddaughter. Lynn Mazeski, a friend of Tommy. Lynn, please stand up. Dottie Neal, my sister. Paul Neal, her his son, her son. Uh, Billy Fisher, uh, my my sister's son. Sierra Toski. Uh, and a, a, a friend of mine, a professional friend, that I uh, came all the way from New Jersey to be here tonight, who I will, uh, will now tell you it will be in the Teaching Hall of Fame. That's how, how, how intelligent this man is about teaching golf. I've known him golf. How long have I known you, Steve? What did he say? <laughs> Steve Bourbon. You've got to have a shot of bourbon. <laughs> A lot of brave minds, a lot of brave minds. And uh, on the other Blue Star table, I have uh, uh, a number of people there, but they're not in, uh, with the fam they're with my family, but I'd like to introduce Susan and Kathy Sylvester. They standing? Uh, Marty Reeder. Her uh, husband, Jack, was supposed to come, but he couldn't make it. So have I got everybody? Have I missed anybody? Thank you very much.
And you know, family is the most important thing in life. Without that, your history. Thanks for coming, everybody. Personal note: We um, we used to when we were younger. We didn't have TV. And we didn't have the Golf Channel, which was probably a good thing that we didn't have it when we were younger. But we were, a lot of us learned how to play golf through your stuff in Golf Digest and your books. And a gentleman today brought out a book, showed it to Bob, and I, I don't know how many books you've written, but um, five or two. This, uh, I think this night, this man epitomizes what this is about because he's a pretty special guy. Well, I've always felt that uh, without golf, I would have not been what I am today. Golf gave me everything I had. I came from a large family. Uh, my dad was a brass worker, and I caddy, started caddying when I was about 10 years of age. And uh, I took to golf like duck taking to a water. I fell in love with the game. I played five sports in high school, but I felt that I couldn't play those sports because I was too small. I wasn't big enough. But I knew I was good enough, big enough to play golf because the club doesn't care how big you are or how small you are. Neither does the ball care. If you know how to swing the club and find the ball and put it in the hole, you'll be a champion. And I proved that to myself at 118 pounds. There'll never be another 118 pound player in the world that'll be the league money winner. <laughs>